In this video, we're going to be talking about conditional probability, independence, and Bayes' theorem. We'll start out by talking about conditional probability. And I think the best way to start is by talking about a farm. I want to give you a little feel before we talk, we start using the, the usual notation. I want to give you a little bit of a feel for what we'll be talking about. Let's say this is my farm acreage. We'll call this like 100, 100 acres, something like that. Let's say that I graze my sheep on, I don't know, what would we call that? Something like, I don't know, maybe 10% of the acreage. We'll call that 10% A, right? So the sample set, the whole sample set of my 100 acre farm is 100 acres, and my the probability of me finding acreage upon which I graze my sheep is about 10%. And so let's say that given I'm in my sample set, what's the probability of me finding acreage upon which I graze my sheep? And that is about, I'm guessing, 10%, right? Actually, most of the time, we just think that we're within that sample set, and what's the probability of finding A in that sample set? So we usually just write it as the probability of A, right, is around 10%. Now let's say that I have cows, too. I love cows. So let's say that I, I graze my cows on kind of a bigger patch, right? So let's say that, well... I'm guessing, well, that's maybe more like 30% of the whole sample set is where I graze my cows. We'll call that B, right? So the probability of me finding acreage upon which I graze my cows is something like maybe 30%, right? And most of the time we think of ourselves as you know, here's the whole sample set right there. So what's the probability of me finding acreage upon which I will graze my cows? It's probability of B, and it's about 30%. Now let's look at this a little differently. Let's say that I am living only within the world of my sheep pen. Right? That's where I graze my sheep, right there, the probability of A. So let's say that given that I'm in the A, in the acreage where I graze my sheep, what is the probability that I will find some cattle grazing land? Well, that would be this little green part right there. So it's given that I'm within A, and I'm going to draw, I'm going to try and draw all of A here, if you can watch. See, it's that whole red part that I'm highlighting in yellow. And if you look at it, it looks like it's about, I don't know, 50% of A is actually this part where I graze my cows. So it's, it's something like half of all of A is, is part of B too. So we can say, given the prob given that I'm within A, what's the probability that I'll find some B? Well, it's about 50%, right? So I can't simplify that anymore. So I just say, given that I'm in A, what's the probability of B? It's around 50%. Now, let's say that given that I'm within B, here's my B, all of this area right there. Given that I'm within B, what's the probability I'll find A? Well, that's a different number. That looks to me like, and I'm just ballparking this, right? So let's get back to our blue. Given that I'm in B, what's the probability I'm going to find some A? It's going to be around, you know, I'm guessing that's about 20%, something like that. I'm trying to make all these numbers a little different so it's kind of clear. So now, now we're getting conditional probabilities. Given I live in the world of A, what's the probability of B? Uh, 50%. Given that I live in the world of B, what's the probability of A? Uh, something like 
So that gives you the idea that condition is, given that I live in one world, what's the probability of the other world, right? Now that's conditional probability. Now one last little thought to leave you with that we're going to soon cover is, look at this. If we, um, I'm going to, I'm going to use this purple right there. See that part right there, which is supposedly purple, but actually it kind of looks black on the screen there. If we lived in the whole world, I'm going to make all of this whole world, this whole universe, everything, everything. That's our S right there. What is the probability of us finding this little purple part or black part right there if it, it, within all of S? Well, it looks to me like it's something like that, that that part right there is around 5%. And I'm just guessing again. How would we find this 5%? It turns out that if we take this right here, and that is the, the probability of, given that we're in A, we've got B, and we multiply it by the probability of A. So it's like whatever is right there, we multiply it by that. That turns out to be 5%. And likewise, we can say given that we're in B, what's the probability of A? And we multiply it by this probability of B, that will also give us that same number, that 5% right in here. And all of these ideas are going to be what we'll explore next. So now let's take a look at how conditional probability applies. We can say that the probability of, given that we're in A, and I drew a little A over there, and that we have B, we can say that that is equal to the probability of the intersecting portions of those two. That's probability of A intersecting with B divided by the probability of A. So you can see, if you look over there, there's, there's the whole probability of A within a bigger sample space. And that's our new denominator. And then we have the little intersecting portion right there. And so, and remember that probability of A has to be unequal to zero because otherwise mathematically it's just not going to work out properly. But that is how we can understand this formula, the conditional probability formula for probability, given A, what's probability of B? And it's a probability function, just like all usual probability functions, and it satisfies all the properties of a typical probability function. So anyway, let's look at this again from a slightly different perspective. Let's say we've got 100 squares here, and those 100 squares, we've, we're going to have, that's our whole set right there. And we're going to draw a, uh, a little set, an, an event that is, it's only nine of these 100 squares. And that's kind of shoddily drawn there, so we'll try and square it up a bit. But that is what we're going to call event C. That's actually event cause, but we'll get to that. So that's nine out of 100 possibilities, or that's the probability. A second event we're going to call the effect, right? So that's event E. And that's got a probability of only four out of 100. And you can see that they inter overlap just a little bit. And with that, we can uh, say that overlap is right there. And it's one out of 100. And that's the probability that C intersects with E. The probability of E, given that, well, let, let's, let's rewrite this in a little bit of a different way. We'll say this number right here, we know uh, that intersecting probability out of this whole sample set of S, which is 100 squares, is got to be 1 out of 100. 
Now, we can also, we, we can say that, hmm, we can see quite clearly that the probability of E is going to be, what, 4 out of 100. The probability of C is going to be, what, 9 out of 100. Now let's say that we wanted, if we look at this probability of AE given that we're intersecting with C, that actually can be written as probability C given that we're in E multiplied by the probability of E. And I know you're thinking, okay, so what? But this is actually going to lead us to an interesting problem with cholesterol and how we can solve it. So look at this. This is We know this is going to be 1, one out of 100. We already know that probability of E is 4 out of 100. And if we're in E, given that we're in E, we have a C. Well, what is that? That's going to be, what, 1 out of 4, right? So we can clearly see that if if you want to find this little intersecting portion as, uh, as something that's, um, what probability out of the entire sample set, which is what we, we have right here, all we have to do is take this, the probability of E, and then multiply it by given given that we're within e where we've got a c what's that probability multiply those two together and bingo we've got this intersecting uh sort of issue or uh, probability now let's imagine that this we're going to just imagine this this isn't really the, uh real numbers but let's say that the effect this effect here that I talked about is actually heart disease. And this cause is cholesterol. So we'll change here. So we'll say that's cholesterol. Oh gosh, I probably misspelled it. Okay, so look at this. If we know what the effect is here, in other words, we know what the probability of having heart disease is, and we also know the probability that given you have heart disease, you've got high cholesterol. Well, hmm, let's look at this. We can actually see that this intersecting thing right here is the same as probability of E given C times the probability of C, right? Because on this side, remember what I did was I took the probabil total probability of E and then I multiplied that by the probability that we'd find C within that E. Well, we can do the same game over on this side. We can say, um, given that we're, uh, or the probability of C, uh, and then we can take that and say, given that we're within C, what's the probability we'll have an E? Well, obviously, it's going to be that same intersecting portion right here. So, in fact, we can write probability of E given that we have C times probability of C is equal to, on one side, uh, and then the other, the probability of C, given that we have E, times the probability of E. And look at, look at this. All we have to do is one subtle little rearrangement. Let's take this one, that probability of C, and put it downstairs, probability of C. Now look at this. If you know that given you've got heart disease, you've got cholesterol, high cholesterol, times the probability of you having heart disease divided by the probability of you having cholesterol or high cholesterol. Bingo, you can actually tease out that given you have high cholesterol, what's the chance you have 
heart disease. Looking at the numbers that we have right up here, um, let's see, we, we know that the probability of, um, if we're in E, we've got C, that's one quarter. Okay. Probability of E is four out of 10. Probability of C itself is, uh, let's see, nine, oops, four out of 100, I should say, nine out of 100. And so, voila, if the probability that given you have high cholesterol, that you also have heart disease, is one ninth, given the bogus numbers that I put in here. So you can actually tease out something you didn't know from other sorts of issues that you did know. This is the best way I've found to look at these sorts of problems. Now why do they even call this Bayes' theorem? They call it Bayes' theorem. He, Bayes was, uh, in the 1700s, he uh, disappointed his father by, by not pursuing a, a theological position. Instead, he followed something that he felt was his spiritual passion, which was mathematics. One problem that he found that fascinated him was the idea of, let's say that I didn't have anything here, and that this was actually just a pool table. What Bayes thought about, of course, he wouldn't have thought about it in terms of a pool table, because it wasn't something that he actually did, but what he thought about was if we had something like that, a table, and we divided it up into maybe a hundred squares, something like that, and we took a ball and we threw it, and we could say that that ball could actually have landed anywhere in this. Let's say it landed right here, randomly. Now, let's say you didn't know where that ball landed. You don't know, but you want to figure out, and you can find out, the only thing you do know is you can pitch other balls and sort of know how they are related to, to this particular ball. So you could pitch another ball, and it lands right here. Oh, well, it landed to the left, right? And then you'd pitch another ball, and it lands here. Well, it's still to the left, and now it's below. You pitch another ball, it's going to land over here, another ball over here, one ball over here. Do you see? You had one, two, three, four balls before you had a single ball over here. So you can, statistically, you can start teasing out, well, let's see, most of the balls are falling to the left and uh, very few to the right, so it must be almost all the way in the right. And likewise, you can do the same to deduce where it is vertically. These are the ideas, actually, that underpin the formulation of Bayes' theorem. We don't know something, but if we know how other things connect to that, we can tease out the information about Bayes' theorem. And this, actually, this theorem is so important, it was used to help crack the Enigma codes during World War II. It's used to help locate submarines. It's been used to deduce who wrote part, who wrote the Federalist Papers. It's a good way of backing into information we want to know using little bits of overlapping pieces of information that we've gotten from elsewhere. Now what we've done already is not quite Bayes' theorem, theorem yet, but it's getting awfully close to it, and I think it gives you an idea of the kinds of things you can do, the power of probability. So let's get an example here. Let's determine the probability that a card selected at random is the ace of hearts, given that the card is a heart. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this in a really tedious way. And the reason I'm going to do that is just so you see all the details. You can see uh, right off the bat, it's, well, let's see, it's got to be 1 out of 13, right? Because there's only 13 hearts and, you know, there's only one ace. So uh, given that, we're, I'm going to draw this out really tediously, but you'll at least have everything at your beck and call now. So we can say the probability of, well, first off we're saying B is the, prob or is the event that the card is an ace of hearts, A is the event that the card is a heart, 
So we can say the probability that you've got the intersection of these two events divided by the probability of having the event A, which is the card, uh, is actually a heart, is, and then I'm going to write this in terribly tedious fashion, so I hope you could forgive me, the number of cards that allow for the intersection of um, the card is a heart and the card is an ace of hearts, divided by the number of total cards in the sample, and so that's going to be 1 out of 52 over the number of cards that are event A, that it's a heart, over the number of cards in the whole sample set, and so I'm saying this is 1 over 52 divided by 13 over 52, and all of that is 1 out of 13. I've just made something really easy and just something very difficult, but the, th the reason I did this is just so that you'll see the steps, so when we do more complicated problems, it, it becomes more obvious how to do them. Let's do another problem here. First we'll say, as far as our example goes, I've got a jar and it's got three blue marbles and five red marbles. So let's suppose that we pick two marbles randomly without replacement. What is the probability that both marbles are blue? This is probably the hardest part of everything in thinking about a probability and statistics, and that's simply how do you choose your events? And the best way to get accustomed to how to choose them is to just do lots of examples, so that's why we're doing this example here. So we're going to define event A as being the first marble is blue, event B is the second marble is blue. So now we can say, we, we've got to convert these, we're looking for the probability that the first is blue and the second is blue. So we'll write that out, out and we'll say the probability that the first is blue and the second is blue. Well, let's see, if we convert that into our usual notation, that is A intersecting B. Now, given what we've just worked through in careful detail, we can write that in two ways. We can write that as either probability of, given that we're, we're in B, or we have B, uh, that we had A, times the probability of B, that we can write it that way. So we can actually say equals to, that's supposed to be equal. Or we can say it's the probability of B, given that we have A, times the probability of A. Oh, okay, so what is that? Probability of A. Now that's the first marble is blue. Well, look at this. We've got three, we've got eight marbles all together. Three of them are blue, so that's got to be three out of eight. Now, given that we've selected one blue for the first one, that leaves us only seven for the second one, and there's only two blue marbles left. So, it's actually, this, this number, probability of A intersecting B, is just 2 sevenths times 3 eighths A intersecting B, and that is 0 0.1. So it depends on the first marble as to what that second marble is, and the conditional probability formula is, is what gives us this information. Now what if we have something like this. We have the probability of, what if we have, that given we're in B, that we have B, you look at the probability of A, and it's the same of the, as the probability of A all by itself. So then the, the fact that that event B occurred doesn't affect the probability uh, of the event A occurring. If that's the case, then event A is statistically independent of event B. So if we look at the previous cards example, we can see the probability of B, given that we have A, that was 1 out of 13. But the probability of B was 1 out of 52. So that meant that B was not 
statistically independent of A. So now we've got uh, another, let's just think about this in a different way. We can say we've got statistically independent events, and those might be something like flipping a coin twice. Knowing the outcome of the first toss, we have no idea what the second toss is going to uh, give us. Likewise, if we roll a red die and, a, and then a green die, knowing the value of the one does not give us any information about the other. So those are statistically independent events. Now let's go for another example. If we have a, we flip a coin twice, we let the events be A is going to be the first toss is ahead, and B is that the second toss is going to be ahead. So then we can say, well, probability given A, the probability that we'll have event B, is just the same as the probability of B, and so that's one half. So usually the first thing we do is we put in the first condition and then the second condition. Now let's let's write this a different way. We can say probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A intersecting B over the probability of A. And that is just, well, let's see, one fourth divided by one half. And so you might ask, where, well, of course, this is equal to one half. You might say, where did I get that one fourth? Well, if we take the sample space, we can write it, well, I'll say bad. This is how you're not supposed to write it. Heads, 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 tails, tails, tails. Problem is, there's several ways to do this one. So a uh, good sample space uh, divides everything up into the elementary events. So we've got heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, and let's see, tails, tails. And so now all of these events are equally likely to occur. And we can see first toss is ahead, second toss is ahead. Okay, bingo. Well, now we're one, uh, one out of four of these events is the, the intersection of these two. And then, of course, um, we already know what the probability of A is. So we're good there. Now, let's go to statistical independence. We can say that two events are statistically independent if probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and probability of B given A is equal to the probability of B. So it follows that the intersection of those two problem or those two events is just probability of A times the probability of B. And see that follows directly from relating these uh, formulas above using the conditional probability formula. So we want to note then that if some events are all statistically independent of one another, then we can calculate their probability of those events, the intersection of those events, by just simply multiplying the individual probabilities. So statistical independence and mutually exclusive are two different concepts. Statistical independence implies that the intersection of A and B, event A and B, is some number between 0 and 1. But mutually exclusive implies that the intersection of those two events is 0. So we could say tossing heads of a coin, that the first toss is a head and the first toss is a tail. Those, those are mutually exclusive events. And here's your comic relief. Here you go. We're engineers. We just design it, and it's up to you to build it. I kind of like that one. Now, let's go on and exercise a little bit more of what we've learned. So, we want to, first off, visualize phase theorem. And this, I've cribbed this from a wonderful website, oscarbonilla.com, and he has a, a great way of visualizing web phase theorem. So, so if we have the probability that some person has has cancer. We could visualize that just as I've done before. What he calls the universe, I call the sample set. And we can just calculate the number of 
people who have cancer, right, divided by the number of people in the whole sample set or the whole universe, and that's going to give you the probability that a person has, a randomly chosen person has cancer. So now event B can mean something rather different. So it could be the people for which a specific type of cancer test is positive. Now, that does not mean that they have cancer. It just means they've got a positive test for the uh, uh, a cancer. So we would take that as the number of people B uh, divided by the, the sample, the number of people uh, in the sample, and that would give us the probability that they would test positive. Okay, so then we could say that, oh, this is getting big, huh? But you'll have seen all of this before, so it should make sense. We've got A is the number of people with cancer. B is the number of people for whom the test is positive. So A intersection B is the number of people with cancer and with a positive test result. So isn't that interesting? They don't coincide. And that's part of the whole problem here. Now if I want to say what's the probability of this intersection? Well clearly it's the number of people who intersect you know between those two conditions divided by the entire universe or and the probability of A given that we have B. So the probability of A given that B is our new universe can be written like this or like this. This is to clearly show you that each each one of these probabilities is actually based out of the whole, but we're using, you can see that we can write it based out of the whole universe, or we can write it using a new base, sort of a new universal base, which is B, which is what we're doing right here. So in fact, this equation is pretty much the same as this one. Here we were using actual numbers, here we're just using probabilities. So we're using the probability of B as our new base. This is our, our new universe in the denominator and we're interested in the intersection of those two of A and B divided by probability of B itself as sort of our base and that is the probability of A given B. Now we can say that the there's an event B, we know it, that's B, B is people for whom the test is positive. B minus this little part right here turns into, let me draw it in red, see this is B minus that little intersecting part. And that is people without cancer, but they have a positive test result. So that's this. Now let's try another one. We'll say that, let's see, over here we've got event A minus the intersecting. Okay, so we'll we'll kind of draw that right in here so that this is this is this event. And that is people who have cancer but they had a negative test result, which is sort of not a good thing. So we're starting to kind of get some inf interesting information. Let's go on. Now let's let's just revise a and understand what we're doing here. We can say that if we change the universe from the entire sample space to just B, and that's the people who for whom that test is positive. Okay, so we've got the probability of B over the probability of A intersecting B. Then we can write it in this way. We've effectively just changed the universe from all people to B, and that's people for whom the test is positive. But we're still dealing with probabilities that are defined for all people, for you. So now let's ask the converse question, and that is, given that we have a, a randomly selected person who has cancer, it's event A, what's the probability that the test is positive for that individual? Okay, so that's the uh, event A intersecting B. This is how we can write that, that situation. And then we can say that, well, first off, we're going to go back. We'll look at Bayes' theorem. We'll say that we get 
if we put Bayes' theorem together, we, we've got these two equations. When we saw this at the very beginning of this talk, look, probability of, of A given B times the probability of B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A. So that means that A intersecting B is the same whether you're looking at it from the point of view of A or B. And then we can rearrange and this is actually the simplest form of Bayes' theorem right here. So all we have to do now is know these numbers and we can figure out the, the solution to our, our conundrum. So backhanded way to find A. This is the last little piece of information that we need to know. If we say that, that we don't actually know what PA is, it, but we kind of know some other information about PA, we can back into finding out what the probability of A is. How's that? Well, look at this. If we say we know the probability of A intersecting B, that's this part right here, and then we can say that we happen to know everything that's not B. Okay, well, let's let's put that here. So not B is going to be, kind of got it now, that's the not B part. But we want the part that intersects with A. Oh, well that turns out to be this part right here, just right here. So you add them both together, right, this probability plus this probability, and you've got the probability of A. Well, from the conditional probability theorem, remember, we can write this intersecting probability in this way. And likewise, we can write this probability in this way. Add them both together and you've got the probability of A. Now you may say, oh, well, this seems pretty complicated, but actually it's not that bad once you get used to it and you want to get used to it because I ask test questions about this, so make sure you understand what this is. So anyway, now let's go forward a little bit and we can say that then, this is our, our real life situation here, if we have people with cancer, we'll call that B and people for whom we get a positive test result. That's going to be M. And B intersecting M is people with cancer and a positive test result. So we can say that 1% of women at age 40 who participate in routine screening have breast cancer. 80% of women with uh, breast cancer will get a positive mammogram at the age of 40. So what does this mean? put that into a quantification we'll put we'll say probability of breast cancer is 0.01 that's from that one percent right there probability that given that they have breast cancer they have a positive on their mammogram is going to be 0.8 oops then we have the probability that the patient or that the uh, the test misdetects the disease, even though the patient does not have it, is 9.6. So what this is, is, and this is a, a little tricky, but we write this as, given that they don't have the disease, they'll have a positive here, and that's 0 0.96, or sorry, 0 0.096. Okay, so now they're asking what is the probability if she had a positive mammography at a routine screening what's the probability that she actually has cancer and we can write Bayes theorem but we're going to write it in the sort of the cheap and dirty form first we can say that times probability of B in other words probability that they have breast cancer and then times the probability that they've got breast cancer and they test positive uh, for with the mammogram and we can write down here probability of M. We know that this is true. Now we know what the probability of B is. We know what the probability of M given B is. We don't know this. We're trying to solve it. Unfortunately we also don't know this. The probability uh, for whom people for whom the test is positive.
but we can back into getting this and here's how we can do it. We can remember that this the probability of M say right so that's just that you get this whole part right here is going to be the probability M given B times probability of B okay now what is that so here's probability of B and right, it's this whole thing and given that we're in B what's the probability of M that's this this part right here right so that's this part of M just this little part plus the probability of M given B naught times probability of B naught so probability of B naught is just well it's everything that's not B here right so it goes all around includes M so it's all this stuff right here and so that's probability of B naught and then the probability that we have that we have M there is this part right little this little rascal right here so between the two of these we can back into getting all of M that's what we've got right here so adding this is the key to finding what the probability of people for whom the test is positive uh, even though we don't really know all of that information now you may say well but wait a minute we don't know some of these things what is B naught well B naught as it turns out is just well we know that the probability of that a woman has breast cancer is one percent so probability that she doesn't have breast cancer is 0.99 and then given that she doesn't have breast cancer and and that she's got a positive test here well that's 0 0.096 this one we already know that's 0 0.01 this one is 0.8 so we can multiply all of those things out together and we already know from up here what what is this probability of given that they have a positive test or given that they have breast cancer what's the probability they'll have a, a positive test on the mammogram and that's 0.8 and then this one right here that's just 0.01 so we've got 0.8 times 0.01 divided by all of this so that and I'm not gonna I'm gonna rewrite it all down here so you can 0.8 times 0.01 divided by 0.8 times 0.01 plus 0.096 times 0.99 and that give us, gives us our total probability given that we have a positive test that we actually have breast cancer is 0.078 isn't that amazing only 7% of people who actually test positive for with breast cancer actually have the disease this is why there's such a, a major discussion going on in national health care issues as to how much we are ought to be testing given the fact that we have such a high percentage of false positives so if we want to look at the general form of Bayes theorem we can do that and this is for when you have very complicated situations you'll just sum up all of the different parts if you want to find out what a is you may have different sorts of values that are all contributing in here you can piece everything all together and ease out the information that you need to know using this more general form which you will use if you become a statistician but that's probably unlikely